Hello, everyone. My name is Brian W. Smith, and um, I have been asked to moderate tonight's discussion with these three beautiful, powerful, strong, overcoming ladies. Um, Ms. Tamaya Davis, Elizabeth Savage, and Asante McGee. Please give them a hand. Because I believe that after you hear their stories tonight, um, you will not only give them a hand, you will feel compelled to support their projects. And at the end of the day, that's our goal. Um, a lot of people have stories to tell. Quite frankly, in my almost 17 years in this business, many of the stories aren't saying much. However, comma, these three sisters have a story to tell. Um, they have gone through a lot, and I think they embody the strength uh, that African American toss around, African American women toss around and, and walk around with um, every day in this country, and it goes unsung and unnoticed. So what I want to do is allow these three ladies to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about themselves, and then I'm gonna ask them some questions and try to make them nervous um, and watch them do what they do. This first young lady, Ms. Tamaya Davis, is from the DMV area. I had the pleasure of meeting her. I first saw her, she doesn't know this, but I saw her on one of those reality shows um, because she runs with the lead singer uh, from SWV. So when her project came around, and uh, one of my literary buddies, Miss Angie Ransom Jones, started working with her, I said, I know her. Um, well, she, she might be a little tough. <laughs> she came out to Dallas, and we all met for lunch, and I walked away thinking, she is a sweetie pie. And then I read her story. And um, it is the kind of story that after you read it, uh, you do not feel comfortable even uttering the word, I'm tired, or I don't feel like doing something. This sister um, almost died in a car crash, not too far from here. And um, she has bounced back to not only um, regain her life, but she's excelling as an entrepreneur and now a published author. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Tamaya Davis. Thank you. How do I even follow that? about my own do, do, story. Do it, do it. How y'all doing? Um, my name is Tamaya Davis, as he said, and the name of my book is From Fatal to Fears. Um, I decided to write this book because um, I was in a near fatal car accident. I had fell asleep behind the wheel. My friends and I, we were hanging out up here in Maryland, and we were driving, I live in Virginia Beach now, and we were driving back to Virginia Beach, and I fell asleep, and I had a tractor trailer. Um, I woke up with this angel over top of me, um, this man that saved me that no one has ever seen before. And um, after that, I woke up two weeks later in the hospital. I spent three and a half months in the hospital. Um, they told my parents that I was dead three times. They said I would never walk, I would never use my hands again. They said that I would be a vegetable and I would have a learning disability if I did make it. Um, I'm a graduate of Old Dominion University. My son is 22 now and he's about to graduate this December. I've owned multiple businesses. I work in the music industry. I also, I've been a longshoreman. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but I've been a longshoreman for 18 years now. So this book is about being a walking testimony and that God is real. So that's the reason why I wrote this book, um, From Fatal to Fears. It is a, yeah, yeah. Give it up. It is a powerful, it is a powerful book. One of the things that inspired me when I read the book was the fact that like a lot of us, there were mistakes that were made as a team. Absolutely. Um, I know we all say that where we came from is what made us today. But in hindsight, is there something you would alter, change, and suggest members of the audience do a little bit different when dealing with their teens who had the, had the attitude, personality that you had. Yes, I had a bad girl attitude. I thought that I could do what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, and how I wanted to do it. And um, as of today, I would say that no, I would not do anything different because it has molded me to be the woman that I became. Um, 
I am way, I'm so humble compared to the person that I was before. And I think that if God did not show me who he was, then um, I probably wouldn't have made it to this age um, that I am, period. But if you have a teenager that is hard-headed, as we say, and um, I would say continue to pray, continue to, to understand that they are, they're young, and continue to understand that they're gonna make mistakes and be there to pick them up, because that's what my parents did. My father never left my bedside at all, even though he told me not to go on that trip, even though he told me not to get in that car that day. My dad had just bought me that car and so forth, but um, I was hard-headed and I went anyway, and that's what happened to me. Um, I used to think that I was the prettiest thing that since sliced bread, but God showed me that, you know, I gave you that, I, I will take it away from you and I will make you rebuild it. So, you know, pray about you, pray on your kids. I pray on my son all the time. I don't go to bed without saying a prayer. I sit by my bed, get on my knees or wherever I am in a hotel or whatever, I say my prayers. So that's, that's the only thing that I know to do is, is pray. You know, people only see uh, the surface of us. Absolutely. And you're a beautiful woman. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank so, you. Try to bring the audience into your struggle, and, and what was the um, what was the the most eye-opening moment of your recovery process? Um, it was very hard with the recovery because my son was only three months when I had gotten the car accident. I was 19 years old. My son was three months. So when I came home, he was six and a half months. Um, I didn't have any use of my hands. I still don't have use of this left hand here. And um, I didn't have use of either one of my hands. And as I said, I couldn't walk. It took me a year to learn to walk again, even though they said that I would never walk again in my life. But um, my, I think the hardest part, and then also to look in the mirror and to try to readjust my mind to become um, equipped to who I had, who I am now, or who I was at that time, it was very hard. My parents had covered um, all the mirrors in the house. Um, every mirror in the house was covered. And one day my mom had left out and went to work and she happened to forget to cover the mirror um, in my bathroom. And I had struggled to get in there. I was like dragging myself to get in there. When I went in there, the mirror, the win the mirror was, wasn't covered. And you guys were like, I really thought that I saw a monster. Like to this day, I still take showers in the dark um, because it was so, and I know that's so weird, but it, it's my, um, I don't know, it's my healing process, but I, oh yeah, I'm getting emotional, I'm trying not to. But just getting to know myself again, um, learning to walk again, it was, it was like my son that was my dedication to walk. Like I knew that I had to walk for him. Um, every single day I would, I would give it my all um, to write again. I couldn't write as much as I love to write and now I'm an author, like, I couldn't even write. They had this machine that they had built to um, put on my hand to like try to make my fingers um, move gradually throughout the days to get some type of mobility in it. Um, they took skin from my butt area and from my stomach area to put across my forehead. So every day of my life for the last 20 years, I've been wearing bangs every single day. Like I, I don't wear any other hairstyle but bangs. And um, a lot of people ask me like, why did you write this book? And is to show people that you're beautiful regardless of what, you, what you're what you going through or what you have went through. Um, I was just talking to this young lady right here and um, you know, we were sharing some things that we have both went through and you're beautiful, like the inside scars and the outside scars, it doesn't make a difference. Just know who you are, love yourself. If you gotta talk to yourself, if you have to write, use a, it doesn't matter how old you are. I don't care, everybody goes through things. If you have to take a piece of lipstick and write it on your mirror in your bathroom every day, I am beautiful, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna do this, or whatever it is. Y'all, I've done everything in the book. I went and seen a counselor. You know, as African Americans, sometimes we feel like we don't have to go get help. Well, I was one that had to go get help because I suffered depression. I wanted to kill myself. I kept asking my parents, like, why did God save me? Why did he just take me out of here? So for me to be here where I am now from where I came from is a true testimony. If I, 
I want to give you this mic and just let you drop. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I just want you to drop the mic. I mean, I don't have anything to say after that. I think you guys need to applaud that. I mean, trust me. At some point, make your way over to her table and look at this poster board because it shows the injuries. And um, I've never seen anything like it. And, and you know, I, I was involved in the, the editing process and, of the book. And after hearing her story, um, like it was a no-brainer for me. Yeah. It was one of those stories I remember telling her, you gotta tell this story. Yeah. You gotta tell, I, I see a lot of manuscripts across my desk. This was one of the few that I was like, like the story has to be told. Yeah, he was actually busy at the time and he, his schedule was full. And when I flew out there and told him my story, he said, I'm gonna push some things to the side and I'm gonna make it happen. So I thank you, Brian. But um, even, you know, on the domestic violence side, I had, my son father had left. Um, like I said, my son was three months and my son father, he left because they had told him I would be like a vegetable. And you know, we 19 years old. He completely left, left my son, never bought him papers, never picked him up, anything, just completely went ghost on us. And I had met this guy that had began to tell me that I was beautiful and that I looked pretty. And, you know, like I said, I'm just going through the process of learning to walk. I'm going through the process of being able to look at myself and so forth and put clothes on and try to look like, you know, try to make myself look like what I was trying to look like before, you know. And he had became domestic, he had became abusive to me. Um, in the beginning, he was wonderful. You know, I thought he was, I thought he was like golden. I was like, oh my God, he's telling me I'm pretty, you know, cause I'm down. I'm, I don't feel pretty and he made me feel pretty. And, you know, I went, went from there to, he was like, let me borrow your car. Let me do this, let me do that, let me do that. I'm like, hold on. I know I'm going through something, but I'm not crazy. Like, why are you picking me up late for, month, for, for work? And um, he went from there and I told him, I remember the first day he hit me and I told him that I didn't want to be with him anymore. And I was like, we need, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was driving down the road by Norfolk State University and he slapped the taste out of my mouth. And it just, I don't know, it just took, it. the confidence that I had got maybe to hear, because this may have been like, maybe two and a half years or so after the accident. So the confidence that I built here, he took me all the way back down there. And it, it went from that to, I remember one night he beat me so bad, y'all. I was on the ground, I pissed on myself. Like it just got super, super bad and I kept praying. And at, at that young age, I was like, God, if you just remove him out of my life, like I promise I won't do this again. I won't be with nobody like this again. And um, God, God will answer prayers, and I don't wish anybody to go to jail, but one day he called me to come pick him up, and I was like, I'm not coming to get you. Maybe like an hour later, I wrote it in the book, about an hour later, um, his friends had called me and said that he had got picked up and he had went to jail. So that was God's way of removing him, but you know, like, I've been through a lot. I have been through a lot, but I'm a conqueror. She has, she's a conqueror. Um, I, I have so much admiration for you. Thank you. Um, so many people would have tapped, would have tapped out, yes. and you didn't. No. Um, you are an inspiration not only to other women but to men. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Why don't you tell the audience um, where they can buy your book, yes. and they can see where you're going to be selling it. Yes. But um, where can they pick up the book? Well, I am, um, my name is Tamaya Davis. That's T-A-M-I-Y-A. So it's on TamayaDavis.com. Um, I'm also over there right now. And my Instagram is Y-N-O-T Tamaya. Why not Tamaya? Yes. Please go pick up this book. These are the type of projects that need to get supported. Um, the world needs to hear this message. But the world can't hear this message if there isn't a groundswell. And that starts at, in, at events like this. So I encourage you all, at some point, deep in, dig into those deep wallets <laughs> and get over there and help this sister build her brand. Because she definitely has a story to tell. Thank you. All right. Next batter up is Miss Elizabeth Savage.
She is the author of a book called No Trespassing, and she is the CEO and founder of a not-for-profit uh, organization that, that specializes in helping the victims of domestic violence. It's called STAND. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Miss Elizabeth Zapp. I read parts of your story, not the entire thing, but I read enough. Um, your story gave me chills, and the reason why it gave me chills is because I grew up with a banner. Um, so I know the psychological effects that it can have on the children. Right. Because I'm, I'm about to be 50 years old, and I know I have PTSD. It's real. Um, my dad died when I was 17. I think I've gone to his grave site twice, maybe. It's just hard. It's just hard. So if you take that, that is the floor of her story. She's going to tell you what happened that takes her trauma to even higher heights than what I experienced. The floor is yours. My name is Elizabeth Savage, as he said, my, as he said, my uh, book is called No Trespassing. It's based on my story. Um, I met my high school sweetheart in high school. Um, he was the football player, basketball, you name it. He was the popular guy in school, sweet as could be. Uh, we dated the whole high school year. We graduated and got married straight out of high school and had our first child. Um, he became abusive when I was pregnant with our second child. It started with the push. And from there it became very physical. Um, he was well known in Amarillo, Texas, so his mom will always hide, um, will always tell me, you know, you can't let people know he hit you. You know, so she kind of pushed it under the rug just because she didn't want her family to look bad. So um, it became very, very violent, where at times he beat me and I couldn't see because that's how bad my face was swollen. Um, he moved me to California to get me away from my family because my family started to notice, you know, like, hey, you've been distant yourself from us. Um, we noticed some scratches on you, what's going on. So he moved me to California where his oldest brother lived. And of course, I didn't have nobody there to support me. Um, so the abuse became worse. Um, got pregnant with our third child and he was born in San Bernardino, California. Um, I had a C-section with all three of my kids. And um, that night that we went home from the hospital, um, he had left and he got drunk with his brother and he came home and tried to have sex with me. But I didn't want to, and so he threw me on the ground and started kicking me, but he tried to kick me on my C-section. Um, so that night he raped me. I didn't know it was rape because he's my husband, um, but now I know that it is rape. Um, so I can see with our fourth child. When I got back to Amarillo, um, the abuse still continued, um, and I finally, in December of 94, I got the courage to leave him. And I packed up my kids and I left. And the reason why I decided to leave him is because the abuse went beyond me. Um, my oldest four-year-old bit him in the back to get him off of me when he was choking me. And he threw her across the room. And that's when I said, it's time to leave for them. So I packed whatever I could in a little small bag and we left. And I said, okay, I'm not ever going back. But he got a hold of my kids on January 3rd of 95. And he said, the only way I could get him back is if, <coughs> sorry, if I went back. So I went back on January 5th. And a house fire broke out. And my life changed forever that day. My seventh month old passed away at the scene. She was burnt. She was my color. And when the police officer allowed me to see her. She was black as a tablecloth. Her lips were melted. Mm. My four-year-old, my hero, passed away on the way to the hospital. Mm. And they told me that um, my son had to be transferred to Louisiana for better heart treatment. So on January 7th, as they prepared him, he died from a heart attack. So my fourth child was stringing on life. And they told me she's not gonna make it. So a month went by, she was still holding on. They said, if she does make it, she's gonna be a vegetable. So you might as well take her off for life support. And I told them no. So three months and a half, she was in a coma. And they finally said, we can't do anything else. She has to come off this life support. So I asked God, if you're real, 
I need you. I need you. And that day my daughter woke up. And the first thing she said in a low voice is, I want some water. They said that she would never walk again. She would never see. She would never have kids. My daughter walks, talks, sees, and has two kids of her own. Um, I wrote this book to give other women and men hope. Um, I had to forgive my ex. I had to forgive the men that hurt me the most so I can step into my purpose. So it talks about how I forgave him, even though to this day he sees that he has not done nothing wrong. Um, it was ruled an accident, so he didn't serve time for the, the loss of the kids, but he did serve time for a parole violation for something else. Um, I do talk to him every now and then because we have grandkids together, so I have to pick them sometimes from him. And it, it's no fear no more. It's like I'm, I'm, he has no change on me anymore. Um, but I wrote this book to give people hope, to know that God is real, um, and that you don't deserve to be hurt. That's not what God created us to be. He created us to be loved, respected, and honored. And um, that's my book. <laughs> You know, um, I started in this business 16 years ago after finding out that the child I was raising, I wasn't the biological father. So that led to me writing a book, right? Um, that child is now 32 years old, and I'm a grandfather. But her mom still has not apologized for taking me to the cleaners for 17 years. I, I bring that up because I'll be the first to admit he's still working on me. And that forgiveness is hard. One of the hardest things, in my opinion, um, people make mistakes. I have a hard time. Um, you know, what's the old saying? If you embarrass me in public, I expect my apology to be in public. Don't embarrass me in public or humiliate me in public and then try to apologize on the down low. Um, one of the biggest problems I've had in my situation has been trying to forgive someone who won't even own what they did. So I say that to ask this question of you. What you went through is far more painful than what I went through because it was the loss of life yet you were able to forgive him. I need to know how you did that. God, God showed me um, the nonprofit organization, but he said first to be able to step fully in the purpose, I had to forgive. I had to forgive the person that I hated the most. And so I didn't want to, because I mean, he took everything I had, my self-esteem, my children, but I had to forgive him to be able to help someone else to have their breakthrough. Because I'm called to be someone else's purpose. Somebody said it earlier this morning, is that we're all called to be somebody else's purpose. And to, for me to be able to help all the women that I have helped, especially the youth, I had to forgive him. To be able to be free, to be, I think when you forgive someone, it shows courage, mm -hmm. it shows faith, and it shows breakthrough. And that's what I had to do to be able to get those, to be able to pour into the youth. That's where we started that program, Born With The Purpose, through the organization, to be able to help the youth. And that's why I had to forgive him. At first, I was like, no, but now I can see him. And literally, I feel sorry for him because he has no, he has no peace. Right. Um, I think she deserves a round of applause just for being able to forgive. Um, because I think in our, in our quiet moments, a lot of people would not be able to do what you have done. What you said is the perfect segue to my next question. Um, can you tell us about your not-for-profit and what, what you guys are doing? Sure. Um, our nonprofit is located in Arlington, Texas. We help victims of domestic violence. Um, a lot of victims doesn't really, they really don't trust the police, so they call on us to go and convince the, the women or men to even leave. Um, 
we are the only organization that's allowed to go into the shelter and remove the young kids from there and go do things with them um, to do mentoring. Um, we have a mentor program called Born With The Purpose where we have the men come in and mentor the boys. And we have, of course, we have the ladies that go in and mentor the girls. Because I believe that if we start with our youth, then this cycle will stop because they will see something different. Um, and that's our goal is to stop the cycle. So um, organization provides.